Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew 7, verses 1 to 14. Judge not that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you not see the speck in your brother's eye, but you do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will be able to see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your peril before the pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his sons ask for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know to give good gifts to your children, how much more your Father who is in heaven will give good things to those who ask him? So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Enter the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow, and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. These are the words of the Lord. Mateo 1, 1 al 14. No juzguen a nadie, para que nadie los juzgue a ustedes, porque tal como juzguen, se les juzgará, y con la medida que midan a otros, se les medirá a ustedes. ¿Por qué te fías en la astilla que tiene tu hermano en el ojo y no le das importancia a la viga que está en el ojo tuyo, en el tuyo? ¿Cómo puedes decirle a tu hermano, déjame sacarte la astilla del ojo cuando ahí tienes una viga en el tuyo? Hipócrita, saca primero la viga de tu propio ojo y entonces verás con claridad para sacar la astilla del ojo de tu hermano. No den lo sagrado a los perros, no sea que se vuelvan contra ustedes y los despedacen ni echen sus perlas a los cerdos, no sea que las pisoteen. Pidan y se les dará, busquen y encontrarán, llamen y se les abrirá, porque todo el que pide, recibe, el que busca, encuentra, y al que llama, se le abre. ¿Quién de ustedes, si su hijo le pide pan, le da una piedra? ¿O si le pide un pescado, le da una serpiente? Pues si ustedes, aun siendo malos, saben dar cosas buenas a sus hijos cuanto más su Padre que está en el cielo dará cosas buenas a los que le pidan así que en todo traten ustedes a los demás tal y como quieren que ellos los traten a ustedes de hecho esto es la ley y los profetas entren por la puerta estrecha porque es ancha la puerta y espacioso el camino que conduce a la destrucción y muchos entran por ella por estrecha es la puerta y angosto el camino que conduce a la vida, y son pocos los que la encuentran. La palabra de Dios. Good morning. Well, my name is Andre Sexton. Uh, that's my wife Jasmine and my son Judah. We're from Oregon. I'm here in Chicago taking the Chicago course on preaching uh, just to gain more skills, gain more tools. I, back home, I'm an elder at my church, Faith Bible Church in Hood River, Oregon. And uh, I preach regularly enough and teach regularly enough through my uh, home study group that uh, I need more tools and, and more training and just to, just to up the game a bit. So that's why we're here in Chicago. and. Uh, we're enjoying our time and enjoying the people out here and so i thank you that you have allowed me to come here and uh, preach the word i just want to start out in prayer father in heaven as we come here this morning to worship you lord i pray that you would receive our worship that you would delight in our worship lord Father, that it would be worthy of you. Father, I pray that uh, as you receive glory and honor through our worship, Lord, that it would strengthen us, that it would edify us, 
Lord, that we would be your body, we would be your hands and feet in this world. Father, that we would be that light that you have made us, all for your name, for your honor and glory and the good of your church, Jesus. Amen. Amen. So, this morning our text, Matthew 7. Uh, living here, I'm not set up, I don't have my office or my printer, so I, last night I'm just putting the finishing touches on my sermon and I realized I can't print it out. <laughs> we don't have a printer, and my printer that I have access is at the school and everybody's gone, so I'm preaching off my computer here this morning, so bear with me as I work with this. I usually have a little outline that I can work with, but uh, the title of my sermon this morning is Charity and Trusting. Charity and Trusting. And what I want to, to preach to you this morning, what I want to try to teach you this morning through this text is that in kingdom living, as our Lord, as our Lord is preaching to the disciples, and he's preaching to them this kingdom ethic, this kingdom way of life here on earth, that as we interact with each other, uh, that the rule for us as we interact with each other is charity. And the power to, to do that, the power to, to live that way with each other comes through the promises of God. So charity and trusting, charity toward each other and trusting in God to do it. Uh, I've always grown up in a Baptist type setting, church, our church back home is Baptist, uh, and kind of always thought this is just the way everybody lives in this Baptist kind of way of living. And uh, we went on a cruise one time with uh, R.C. Sproul through Ligonier Ministries, and I forgot that they're Presbyterian. And so we're on this cruise, and the Presbyterians are enjoying their drinks. And us as Baptists are like, kind of like, what? <laughs> and it reminds me of this story of, of this guy who he goes away, and he, he's a Baptist, and he goes into this uh, Presbyterian setting, he's getting training, and he's, he comes in, and he's like, oh, these Presbyterians, they're so worldly, they, they enjoy their, their life and mingling in the world, and they, you know, you, you get invited to their house, and they offer you a drink, and this is this is unacceptable but as the months go by he begins to enjoy this this newfound freedom he has inside this presbyterian context so all of a sudden he shifts from judging the presbyterians to turning an eye towards the baptists and saying those darn baptists <laughs> our judgment can be very fickle and very service level and very sometimes even uninformed and so here in the text we have a uh, a command from the Lord not to judge. And our first question for us is, um, but how? How can we judge? We, we know that judgment is necessary. We know that to live this life, we have to be constantly making judgments. Even our Lord Jesus told us to judge righteously. Don't judge from the mere appearance, but, but dig in, search the heart, understand, and make right judgments. But we live in an age of tolerance. We live in an age that we are not to judge anybody. The, the, the rule, the golden rule of our secular society is, is judge not, it's tolerance. You don't question anybody's way of life. You don't condemn anybody's way of life. It is the secular, whole, the secular way of holiness is accepting everything the way people live. They're, uh, understanding their viewpoint, we have to accept it all. And so it's, we live in a very secular, anti-judging, pro-tolerance society. And, it, and so this verse fits the secular world. The verse, if there's one famous verse in all the Bible besides John 3.16, it's this verse. Uh, uh, don't judge me. Judge not, lest you be judged. That's, that's the cry of the secularists around us, and it's also the cry of the, the nominal Christian that surrounds us, the, the, the ones inside who want to live the way they want to live, and they throw this verse at you. This is one of the most famous verses. But we know that we must judge. We know that we can't have a society without judging. Government must judge. 
We have to have laws. We have to have rule and order to our society. And so there must be judges that, that enforce laws and, and make judgments and uh, hand down sentences. Our society would absolutely collapse if we did not have rule of law and judgment inside of our society. Churches must judge. Myself as an elder, I, I, to practice church discipline, I, I have to make judgment calls. Even as I preach and teach to my people, I have to judge the, where they're at. I have to see where they're at. I have to, as I preach the, the lessons, I have to go to where the heart of the matter is or my teaching is pointless. I have to make judgment calls. It's absolutely vital. And we know that families must judge. As a, as a dad and my wife raising our children, <laughs> I am not going to have the attitude of uh, just, oh, whatever, son, whatever, daughter. It, it's, I'm, I'm looking at every little thing as I raise my, my children and making judgment calls of what I'm going to expose them to, what I'm going to teach them, what I'm going to withhold at, the, at an age-appropriate uh, level. And so we must judge as parents. Uh, and even as individuals, we have to make judgments. When we come to the communion table, what does the Lord call us to do? Let a man judge himself. We must judge ourselves inside and see where we're at so that we do not take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. Or the consequences could be death. Judgment is absolutely necessary. And God must judge. God's going to judge the world. He's going to judge the, he's going to judge those who reject him. And he's going to judge us as believers. And that's the warning we have here in this text. He says, do not judge so that you will not be judged. For in the way you judge, you will be judged. And by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. As I studied this text this week, I never looked at this warning before. And I was actually kind of stunned. Like, this is a serious warning to the church. He's saying, don't judge. Because the way you judge is going to be measured to you on that day that we stand before him. I think one of the things that is that, that the church misunderstands in our day is that concept of judgment before the Lord. There is going to be that day that we stand before him as believers, and there's going to be a final analysis of our life. Even uh, you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 3, when he talks to the, uh, Paul is talking to those uh, that are going to take over after him, and they're going to build on that foundation as leaders inside the church, as elders inside the church. He says, be careful how you build upon the foundation. You need to build with precious stones, gold, silver, not with hay, wood, and stubble. And on that day that we stand before him as elders, as leaders inside the church, he's going to judge those works. And it's going to be a serious judgment because the works that are wood, hay, and stubble are going to burn up. And there's going to be loss on that day. He even makes a point in that passage that you're going to be saved, but you're going to suffer that loss, elder. If you don't preach and teach the word faithfully, all that work will burn up. It's wood, it's hay, it's stubble. So there is a seriousness to the judgment of God, even for the believer on that day. It even says in James 3.1, let not many of you be teachers because you're going to encounter a stricter judgment. There is a judgment day coming. And he's going to judge us according to our works. The faithful, the Christians, the ones who have put their faith in Christ, he's going to judge our works. He says in Matthew 25, he says, on that day when he separates the goat from the sheep, the goat will be on the left, the sheep will be on the right hand, and he'll say to the sheep, enter in Blessed are you, the Father, enter into the joy. For when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me drink. When I was naked, you clothed me. And what will the righteous say? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? He says, it, as, as far as you did it for the least of these, my brethren, you did it for me. 
He's going to judge us on our works. Our works declare, our works are the fruit of who we say we are. It is the fruit of believing in Jesus Christ. So we must judge. We must, we must, as we enter this text, realize and understand there is a necessity to judge because we're going to be judged. And the warning here is that the way you judge is the way, is the measure he's going to measure against you. It's the tone you have, he's going to use that tone with you inside of that judgment. He says in John 5, 28 to 29, Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and will come forth, to, forth from the grave. Those who did good deeds to the resurrection of life, of those who committed evil deeds to the resurrection of judgment. Our works matter. The way we live as believers matter. And this is the whole point of uh, chapters 5, 6, and 7. This is kingdom living. This is how believers live in a world, a fallen world, but as kingdom citizens. So what is it then? What is it? What is the, the, the command here not to judge then? If judge, judgment is necessary, then what is our Lord saying here? What, what are we not to do in judgment? Well, I think this is, comes down to a heart issue. This is kingdom living amongst each other as brothers and sisters in the Lord, inside the church, how we deal with each other. In verse 3, he talks about, Why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? I think this is a funny picture. You think about Christian life together as brothers and sisters inside the church, and the Lord has given us a visual here, an illustration of a guy with a plank in his eye, a big old log in his eye. The, the sin or, or the error, whatever is in his life, it's like a big log in his life. But yet, that person with the log in their eye can see past that log to catch the little speck in your eye. This is a hard issue. He's not recognizing his, his failings before the Lord. He's not recognizing his sin. He's not recognizing the log that's in his eye. And we know this is hyperbole, but it's, to, but it's to illustrate the magnitude of the error of when we, can, when we don't look at ourselves and we don't judge ourselves. And so what happens when we don't do that? What happens when we, we are not taking stock and we're not looking at our lives and evaluating and judging ourselves? Because we judge ourselves very uh, kindly, don't we? Very generously. Uh, sins are not sins anymore. They're mistakes. They're, they're shortcomings. Oh, I had this experience and that experience. And so the speck that the sawdust, it grows and grows and becomes a log. And I think that the, the, the foundation of that, the, 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 the life juice in that is pride. I think it's pride. I think we, we look at our accomplishments, our successes, the places where we have done well, and we, we, bang, we stay there, and we just hunker down there, and we feel good about it. It feels good to do well. But then when we sit there, and it, and it grows, and then all of a sudden you start to think you really are what everybody is saying about you, and then you start to look at others, and you start to, the, the view of them starts to go down a little bit. And all of a sudden you're seeing errors in them, and you're looking like, well, I don't do that. Why are they doing that? So the judging that happens now isn't a judging to help. It's a judging of condemnation. It's a judging that's hypercritical. It's a judging that is coming against somebody, our brother or sister in the church, not to help, but to put down. And the Lord is saying here, do not judge in a condemning, hypercritical way. That's not what we're called to. But I think there's also um, another way that pride enters in in our judging. It's not simply just the pride of, of excellence and you're looking down, but it's also the pride of inferiority. I think there's a lot of us that we, we see our shortcomings. We see where we lack. And so when we see it in other people, we, we, can, we, can, we can pinpoint it and we spot it out and we go there. Because what happens when we point out 
the feelings in others that we know we have already, it makes us feel a little better. It makes us to feel a little bit, it, it helps us to, to overcome that feeling of inferiority when we spot it out and we, and we hammer somebody else for it. It makes me think of the story of the tax collector and the sinner. Both of them are at the synagogue and they're praying. And the tax collector, or the Pharisee, is praying to the Lord, Lord, I, I thank you that I'm not like the tax collector, this sinner. I thank you that I, I tithe everything I have. My, my men and cumin, and I obey the law, and I do all this. He's, he's full of pride. And he's judging the man who's sitting right next to him, who's beating his chest, saying, Father, forgive me, a sinner. Pride blinds us. Pride elevates ourselves up in a place, in a position that we ought not to be. Remember chapter 5, this begins, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who recognize their bankruptcy before a holy God. And they live in that, in that reality. See, what happens is we step out of that reality. Things get going good and we start to look down on others. We have failed to judge ourselves. And that's the necessity. We must judge ourselves, evaluate ourselves. Most judgmental. Remember in this text here in chapter 5, unless our righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees, we won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And why did the Pharisees hate Jesus so much? Because they were envious of him. And so they judged him because of envy. Do you ever suffer with that? Do you ever see somebody who's just they keep succeeding, they keep going forward, and you start to become envious of them, and then you start to get a little judgmental of them. You start, uh, things that you would have never even thought about before, you start to like, oh, he's so this and this and that. Ah, oh, she's just this and this and that. And the only reason you're saying this is because you're envious. Brothers and sisters, that's not the love of God. This is absolutely inappropriate, and it's not kingdom living. Our Lord says here, judge not, because this is not the way his church lives. He says, take out the log out of your eye. Judge yourself first. And what happens when we judge ourselves first? What happens when we get real with God? What happens when we sit down, we kneel down, and we pray, and we confess our sin? What does it do? It humbles us, doesn't it? We realize we're not that great. We realize we have got our issues. And, and all of a sudden, that being poor in spirit just comes right back in. That humble attitude that looks at the brother and sister now with, with charity, now looks at them with love. This is what our Lord wants us to be. Poor in spirit, thirsting for hunger, hungering and thirsting for righteousness. But judgment is necessary with each other, isn't it? Because we are our brother's keeper. And so what is the right way to be, to live in this relationship, kingdom living with each other? What is the right way then? I think Galatians 6.1 captures it. Brothers, if anyone is caught in a transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. So as our brother's keeper, as we do life together in kingdom living, and we notice, we see each other going down a path that we shouldn't be going, or, or maybe starting to veer off that straight and narrow, we have a responsibility to make that judgment call, but in gentleness, in love, as we come to correct for the purpose of restoration. Brothers and sisters, you have a, an obligation to each other in this way, in loving each other, not in condemning each other, but in a heart of restoration, in a heart of love for the body of Christ. He says also um, in 1 Corinthians 5, but now I'm writing to you that you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister who is sexually immoral, or greedy, an idolater, 
a slander, a drunkard, a swindler. Don't even eat with such a person. We have to make judgment calls. So what is our Lord saying here and saying, do not judge for the way that you judge, it will be measured back to you. He's saying, don't have a hypercritical, condemning spirit. Don't be a fault finder. Don't come at each other to put each other down. In love, speak the truth to each other. In gentleness, restore each other. God is love, and his children are going to be children of love. This is kingdom living. This is the straight and narrow. This is what our Lord calls us to. And I think it, it hits me hard because I am an elder and I have to make those judgment calls. I have to practice church discipline. But, I, but you do it as an elder in terms of love. The first priority in church discipline is restoration. We want the member to commit or to uh, confess their sin, to repent of it and come into fellowship. Don't want to excommunicate anybody. That's not the heart of church discipline. Church discipline is restoration and walking with the Lord together, hand in hand. So we see in the first section of this church discipline, or <laughs> sorry, first section of this in judge not, it's, it's not to have a condemning spirit. We, we are to never have a condemning spirit with each other, never to be critical, never to be hyper uh, uh, sensitive, fault finding, but our, our spirit with each other is love. It's, it's coming together as believers to keep each other on the straight and narrow, walking this walk to heaven. That, that's the call here. And then when we, think, when we think of chapters 5 and 6 up to this point, the whole context, our Lord preaching here, and you look at verse 12, in everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. What's he mean by this is the law and the prophets? The law and the prophets is the word of God. Believers are people of the word. Believers are doers of the word. And when we do the word, it comes out in love for one another, not judging one another. It comes out in a heart of restoration. It comes out in a heart of keeping us on this straight in narrow. And so you, you're, ended all, you're at the end of all these commands and you're thinking to yourself, how can I do this? This is a tall order. How can this be done? Starting in chapter 5, he promises persecution. Verse 16, we're the light of the world. We're to live as lights in this world. We're not to live like the rest of the world. We are to be that light that the world sees and wants to come and know your God. Because you're not like them. You are the salt of the world. You're to be that flavor that like, they, they tasted like, what is that? That's foreign to me. I don't get it. That's what we do as kingdom living Christians. He says hate is equal to murder. Looking and lusting is adultery. No divorce except for infidelity. Our word must be good. Our, I, our yes is yes and our no is no. When someone gets against us and strikes us, turn the other cheek. Go the extra mile. Love your enemies. This is a tall order. How are we going to do this? Because this is the righteousness that exceeds the Pharisees' righteousness. And we must be more righteous than the Pharisees because the Pharisees did not end up in heaven. And they were worshipers of God. How do we do this? And then he ends chapter 5. Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How do we do this? Verse 6. How, how are we to worship God? Pure and only for his eyes, not to gain anything outside of it, inside of our worship towards him, as the Pharisees did. They loved the accolades and the praise of men. They loved the benefits that came with it. 
We see, we see men like that today, don't we? They love the position right here because of what it gets them. And they don't see it as the place that this is service to the sheep. Don't store treasures in heaven or don't store treasures on earth. How do we as Americans live like that? It's all we've been trained in. And Jesus is saying, don't do it. Build up treasures in heaven. This is kingdom living. Don't worry about food, clothing, housing. Seek the kingdom and he will add all these things to you. So this morning as I say this, maybe you're confused, you're talking, preacher, what are you talking about, works? We're saved by faith alone, uh, in Christ alone, through grace alone. Yes, we are. That's the gospel. Christ saves us. But remember who preached this. It was Christ. And who did he preach it to? Believers. And our, our righteousness must surpass that of the Pharisees. So I want to connect this gospel to you, and I want, to, I want you to understand this. This is the narrow way. This is the narrow way of Christian living that leads to life. But what I want you to remember and understand is that the gospel of Jesus Christ doesn't just justify us. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, and, and God sees it, he declares us justified, saved, my child. That's what justification does. We are saved, sins forgiven. But you know what else the gospel does? It transforms us. God doesn't just save us and leave us to our own uh, strengths, our own uh, devices. But he transforms us. And I just, I just want to turn your eyes quickly to Ephesians 2. This is how we live this kingdom life that he's preaching. Jesus is preaching to his disciples here in 5, 6, and 7. This is how we do it. This is what he did for us, for you, when he justified you in faith in Christ. And you were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them we too all were formerly lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, or by nature children of wrath, even as, the, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. This is how you live the gospel kingdom life, is he made you alive, Christian. You're not the same person. He gave you a new heart. What does that mean? He gave you a new nature. He gave you a nature that now is inclined towards him, is inclined towards righteousness, is inclined towards love. You are not the same creature. You are not the same as somebody who does not believe. You have a different nature, a different heart. This is what it means to be born again. This is why Jesus can preach this to his disciples. Because it's a reality. This is what the gospel has done for us. It hasn't just justified us. It has transformed us and given us a heart. And he's raised us up with him and seated us up with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, in union with our Lord. Before we were in Christ, we were in Adam. And everything about Adam, his nature, every, all of his works affected us and continued to affect us. So that the only path we were ever on was the white path. We could never make it there. But God, in his love, made you alive and has given you a new spirit and a new heart to love him, to follow him, to stay on that straight and narrow. 
This is what the gospel's done for us, brothers. This is why Jesus can preach this to us. Because this is what we can do through the new nature, but not only through that new nature, but through his promises. Look at these promises. This is staggering. He goes on. Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. What is our Lord saying here? He bids us. He invites us. He commands us. He says, come to me. You want to know how you're going to live this Christian life? Come to me. Ask. Seek. Knock. And then what does he say here? This is astounding. He says he bids you three times here. Now he's going to promise seven times to answer your, your, ask, your call, your prayer. He says, everyone, he says, ask, you will be given. That's a promise. Seek and you will find. That's a promise. Knock and it will be opened to you. That's a promise. That's the promise of our God. For everyone who asks, receives. There's a promise. And he who seeks, finds. Another promise. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. That's another promise. And then he says, If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? That's another promise. Our God is for us. He's all for us. The gospel did not just justify us. It transformed us and it empowered us. And it made us children of God. Look what he says. How much more will your father? He even says it here. I'm your father. You want to live the victorious Christian life in kingdom living? Come go to your father. Pray, ask, seek, knock, and he promises you, I will answer. If you're struggling with lust, go to the Father, knock, seek, he will take it from you. You're struggling with getting along with your brother and sister, take it to the Father. He promises you eight times here to answer those calls. Because what's at stake? The church is at stake. And if the church is at stake, what else is at stake? The glory of God is at stake. And all of this, your salvation is for the glory of God. Oh, brothers and sisters, we can bank on this. We have not because we ask not. And these are promises he gives to us to live this life. These are not promises to give you a car, to give you a big fat house, not to give you a career that you can take pride in. It's not that. It's to live this life kingdom life here on this earth while he has you here for his purposes. This is his goal for you. This is his aim for you. And it's for everyone. Okay, he says here, for everyone who asks, it's not just for you think that the super spiritual, it's not just you may have had a bad week, a bad month, a bad year where you're just fighting sin and struggling. You're, you're dealing with issues in your life and you think, oh, I've got to get right with God before I can go and pray and ask. I've I got to do this the right way. He's not going to listen to me. No. Right there in the midst of it, for everyone who asks, you go to him. That's how you're going to solve it. Not on your own. That's works righteousness. We do these works in the power and the strength of him. And so this morning, brothers and sisters, I just wanted to encourage you that this kingdom living, this life here on earth as kingdom citizens of heaven, children of God, we do it in charity, we do it in love towards each other, and we do it banking on the promises of God. Take God at his word. Preach the word to God. He, he, he loves it. He wants you to hear him uh, 
to, 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 to read back his word to him because his people are children of God. So charity in love, charity with our relationships with each other and a whole life banking on the promises of God. Thank you. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your promises. We thank you, Lord, for what you've done for us in the gospel. We thank you that you died and you paid for our sins. We thank you that you gave us life in you, that you have given us a new nature. You've given us a new heart that loves you. Father, strengthen us in that love that we may glorify you. Offer your fame, Jesus, and the good of your church. Amen.